approach your ownership. You may be surprised by the by the answer. I mean, hey, I'm right now. I I want to know who in 20 years is going to buy me. So, Business of Architecture, episode 359. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking to Christian Giordano, who is the president and majority shareholder of Mancini Duffy, who are a technology first design firm with about 90 people who are based in New York City and New Jersey. Um, They specialize in architecture, interiors and planning of the built environment. Now Christian is an innovator, an entrepreneur, a visionary and a disruptor. He's the inventor of the tool belt and host of the Anti-Architect podcast. Now the tool belt's quite interesting. This is a collaborative 3D software suite which they use to facilitate design with their clients and other consultants. And it was a delight speaking with Christian uh, about his career and how he has been leading the new succession of Mancini Duffy. Um, In this conversation we discuss entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship within Mancini Duffy. So that's how The business culture there has been nurtured in a way to have their employees actually start new businesses within the firm. We discuss how Christian became the CEO and majority shareholder of a practice that already has a hundred year old history. And we talk about the importance of transparency in developing business culture. So sit back, relax and enjoy Christian Giordano. Christian, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. Absolute pleasure. Now, you are the the president and the majority owner at Mancini Duffy. Um, You guys are based out on the East Coast in New Jersey. Um, You're also an inventor of the tool belt. You are the host of the Anti-Architect podcast. And I understand you were also taught by Frank Geary at some point in your (laughs) career in the University of California. So a very distinguished um, career that you've had and, you know, quite an incredible journey that you've been on. So absolute pleasure to have you here on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I've, I've enjoyed listening to your podcast as well. Um, it's, um, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Excellent. So let's just jump in and, and start with your early career and how you've navigated to the role that, you've, that you're now occupying at Mancini Duffy. And was that, you know, how did you, how was it, was there much forethought in, in the, how that happened or how did it evolve? Sure. So uh, I'd love to take you through that story. So, um, you know, I, I went to architecture school, like, like most people, a five-year degree at the University of Miami in Florida, wonderful school, actually a very traditional um, uh, education, a lot of hand drawing. Um, it was before computers. I think computers were just starting at that point in terms mm-hmm. of CAD. So it was a traditional um, education in that respect. Uh, and, you know, I, I, it's interesting. I worked at a firm as an intern there called Swanky Hayden Connell, which is no longer uh, around, unfortunately, but mm-hmm. a wonderful firm. It was large. They had multiple offices around the, around the world, frankly. Um, and I had interned there, and I, uh, there was a, a, a wonderful uh, fellow there uh, by the name of Richard Carlson. And Richard uh, always had said to me, hey, if you ever come back to New York, um, if you ever want a job in New York, you're, you're welcome to give me a call. So I went on to graduate school right after the University of Miami uh, at UCLA uh, in California. I always wanted to move to LA, and as you mentioned, I always wanted to uh, have Frank Gehry as a professor. I heard he taught there and that was my goal was to get there and, and learn from Frank Gehry. Yeah. Um, I ended up taking a, you know, one class he did, he did teach a, a studio class. He, uh, he came four times to the school, <laughs> uh, but with the cool part was we got to also go to his office and kind of watch his process and see mm-hmm. him there. It was really more of a lecture. Um, and then the, the, the class itself was taught by, um, some really interesting professors, one of them, Greg Lynn, who's got a pretty distinguished uh, career as yep. a technologist almost now at this point. Uh, and so it was, it was really great to, to work with Frank Gehry and to, and to you know, kind of see how he worked and see the culture of his office. Mm. Um, and it was something that always stuck, uh, you know, kind of uh, stood out to me uh, as I kind of moved through my career because 
his office, you know, for a star architect, he might be the exception where, you know, listen, not that people don't work, you know, a lot there and late hours, but that wasn't generally the culture. It really was a culture of um, like a normal work-life balance. And, wow. you know, this was now 25 years ago, and it seems mm. it, you know, very progressive uh, in that respect. And so when I was in California, I, um, I remembered Richard Carlson from Swanky Hayden Connell. And I remember that he said, if I ever wanted a job back in New York, I could, uh, I could give him a call. So I called him and I'm not quite sure he remembered who I was, Mm -hmm. um, but he was nice enough to make good on his word. And I, you know, after I graduated, I moved back to, uh, to New York city and I started working at Swanky where I worked for uh, probably about five years or so. And, you know, I was a a junior person kind of working whatever hours I could and, you know, it was a large firm, probably 200 people or so here in New York. And it, uh, um, the, the beauty of that is I, I did meet my wife uh, at, that, at that firm as well. So that was, uh, you know, obviously a critical path to be taken. Uh, but what I learned from that firm was the, the, the two Richards, as we called them, Richard mm-hmm. Carlson and Richard Hayden, um, were actually also very much family guys. Uh, they, they, enjoyed, you know, hard work, but they also made time for their families. And again, it's kind of something that stood out to me as I matured through my career. Right. I got a good variety of projects there that I worked on, schools, um, uh, some interiors work. I've always seemed to work at firms that uh, had both uh, corporate interiors and uh, new buildings, base building architecture. Um, So, My next stop was uh, a firm called HLW International. Um, They are a a large powerhouse firm uh, headquartered out of New York City. They have an office where you are in uh, in the UK, uh, uh, offices around the world as well. And I worked there for about 15 or so years. And uh, it was really a wonderful experience because I I worked my way up through that firm. Uh, and, you know, for anyone listening that, you know, uh, thinks about kind of how do they mature in their career, mm. I, I did it very traditionally. I just worked. Uh, I had patience. I learned from as many people that I could. Mm. Uh, I took the lessons, both good and bad, uh, from HLW. HLW um, has some amazing people that are, that are there. Uh, I probably would have never left if the offer from Mancini Duffy uh, hadn't come along uh, about uh, seven or eight years ago at this point. Right. And, um, you know, there again, I worked on a variety of project types from interiors, Google interiors, to new buildings, broadcast buildings, headquarters, um, you know, some, some real architecture. Um, and so kind of finding that balance in a, in a corporate firm in New York City is sometimes a difficult thing. You know, there's a lot of what I would call churn work, mm-hmm. um, where you're doing work repetitively for uh, for clients, and they, um, and and now as a business owner, I appreciate that kind of work very very much because that pays the bills. And then yeah. there is the work where you're going to try and win awards and really do some design work. Yeah. And I was lucky to kind of mature as a senior designer as. Um, as I grew at that firm, I, I was very much put into a position there where I wasn't quite ready to be in the position. Um, and again, another lesson learned as now having my own firm, um, you know, putting people in a position that they're not necessarily ready for, but you're confident that they could do it and step up to the plate. You know, HLW allowed that for me and it was, um, you know, invaluable into how I matured. Mm. Uh, when, when you find yourself in a position like that, um, how important is it to have mentorship around you and people that you can, can look to towards leadership and, and, and was that available there for you? You were kind of, you were nurtured in that, in that kind of. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there was a senior designer, a, a, a senior partner, uh, Michael Barrett right. there who, uh, was just a, a wonderful architect amazing designer and also a, a painter, um, had his own painting studio, which always impressed me the most. And Michael was very good about letting myself and another 
uh, a friend of mine who still works there, this uh, a person named uh, Ed Shim, uh, he let us kind of do our thing. He stepped back. Um, I remember I was designing a, a, a building for HBO, um, the, the, the broadcast network. Mm. And I had a concept that I wanted to, you know, bury the building below grade and just have this floating glass box above the landscape. And I remember saying to Michael, you know, this is my idea. I just, I can't imagine that HBO is going to go for this. Um, you know, they're corporate. This seems a little too, you know, out there for them. You know, there's no way. And he said, no, man, go for it. Go for it. See what happens, you know. And they went for it. And that thing's built. And there's, it's a floating glass box above a buried landscape, which is hilarious. Amazing. Uh, but he was good about that. He, he stepped in when he needed to, mm -hmm. but he gave us the freedom to kind of move forward and not necessarily fail, but give enough slack in there that we could, we could um, you know, kind of you know, call for help if we needed. Got it. Got it. And, and how did the, the move to Mancini Duffy appear or the opportunity? So, yeah. So um, here in the U S we work with a, a variety of um, uh, different client types. And one of them is a, uh, we have project managers. I know you guys do two there. Yep. Gardner and Theobald is one. VVA is another. I know you guys have G&T out there in the UK. Um, so I worked with uh, um, someone at, at VVA. Um, and he said to me, as a fellow by the name of Ray Arnold, he said to me, hey, there's, um, there's a guy I'd like you to meet. Um, he's, he's retired from his firm. Uh, but he's gone back to his firm recently just to kind of help out. And, you know, he said that they need some young blood in there, someone around 40 years old to come in, kind of shake things up, you know, see kind of what, what could be made of this, this old firm of his. And so I went and I wasn't sure who I was meeting because uh, they wanted to keep it confidential. And I met Ralph Mancini. Uh, and Ralph was about as charismatic of a guy that you've ever met. Um, one story I love about Ralph is that um, he never had a desk at Mancini Duffy. <laughs> he just walked around. He managed by walking around. He had an acronym for it. I forget what it was, but um, he would sit next to people randomly and just chat with them. Uh, you know, he didn't draw. He didn't, uh, he didn't project manage. He didn't send emails. He didn't, he didn't care about any of that stuff. He was just client focused, construction focused, and people focused. And that's what he did. Uh, so I, when I met Ralph, uh, he said to me, you know, listen, I'm looking for a young guy to come in and kind of shake things up at this firm. Um, we have, you know, it's still a great firm, um, but the leadership there is, um, you know, probably near retirement age. And would you be willing to come in and kind of uh, speak to somebody? And so I said, listen, I'm not really looking to leave, but I'm, I'm, I'm open for the conversation. Mm -hmm. And ultimately came here and, um, Met two people, um, uh, Tony Sharippa and Dina Frank. They were the primary owners of the company, uh, both legends in New York City in terms of interior design and uh, Tony uh, in the uh, AIA, American Institute of Architects. And I met them both and we kind of struck a deal. And my, my feeling behind it was as much as I loved HLW, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of partners and owners and stuff at those big international firms. Yeah. And for me as a guy who at the time was, you know, just turning 40, um, you know, how in this corporate structure was I going to get to a point of ownership? Mm. I had always, I'd always wanted to have my own firm yeah. um, from probably, you know, a few years into HLW. Um, and frankly, I'll, I'll probably get in trouble from this from HLW, but uh, I did a lot of freelance work. Yeah. Um, and I will say for anyone uh, looking to uh, kind of expose themselves to other aspects of the architecture profession, freelance is a, is a great way of doing it. And, and in a weird way, we encourage it here at Mancini Duffy. Right. Uh, to me, if, if you can do freelance work and still get your day job done, wow, you're going to be an awesome asset to any company that hires you. 
Um, so I did a lot of freelance work. I did. I, did. I, I love I love that. I love that actually <laughs> as, a, as a way of thinking about it. So many companies can be very, no, we don't want you to um, doing any work outside of what you're doing here. There's often a lot of concern that it's going to take their focus away. But the fact that you actually recognize it as, well, if you're able to do that and it's not impacting your day job, there's there's some real skill sets going going on there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I would you know, I would work my day job and, and make sure I, I got every single thing I needed to. And then I would go home as before I had kids and I would crank out drawings for and designs for all sorts of different types of projects from small commercial projects to uh, people's apartments. I did, a, I did an 11 bedroom apartment renovation once. Um, it took two years. I mean, I, I don't know how I did it, but, but I did and kind of had no idea what I was doing while doing it. <laughs> Um, but kind of figured it out along the way. So, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, I always wanted to have my own firm and this idea that, you know, I, I this long line of principals and partners in front of me. I mean, it could have taken 20 more years before I got to that point. Yeah. And so I, I gave the Mancini Duffy a shot and, you know, and here we are. <laughs> Amazing. So, so they were, they were offering you ownership or how did, how did that kind of evolve as part of the, the deal and did you you know what, what was the role that you first kind of entered into and sure. how has that role evolved so i came in with a similar title as my title from hlw which is a director of architecture role right. uh, which I, I ran the architecture department at hlw so it seemed logical to kind of continue that here at mancini as that was actually building here at mancini they mm-hmm. were very much focused on corporate interiors uh, but the recession of uh, 2008 hit them really hard right. um, because they were so corporate interiors focused and so focused on financial institutions, mm-hmm. which of course was the real uh, part affected. So to their credit, you know, Tony wanted to really diversify, get some new buildings under his belt uh, and, and make sure this firm became a more of a 50, 50 kind of structure, um, which ultimately now we are very much so um, and so I came in as the director of architecture uh, with a principal title. And, but I, there was a little bit of discussion of ownership, uh, but it hadn't really been formalized. Right. And I would come in uh, and then within a, you know, the deal was that in a six month period, they would make me the president of the firm. Now, I thought that was cool, to be honest with you. <laughs> and again, I, I'm all about, I, I, am, I am very realistic, you know, yeah. I'm a, I'm a designer, architect, you know, um, but business person, I am not. Right. Um, you know, these are president of an organization. I really didn't know what that meant other than it sounded like a cool title. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just being honest. And then when, when I started working here, um, to Tony and Dina's credit, they, they, in their mind, saw me as the future president of this company. Mm-hmm. And so they let me begin to make the changes and build the culture and the type of firm that I wanted. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how we led to where we are now as the firm. If you were to look at this firm, you know, 10, 20 years ago to where we are now, it's probably unrecognizable to anyone that worked here. Um, you know, we're, we're so embedded in our culture and, mm-hmm. and how we've built it. And then the other things that we've done, which we could talk about as well, is the technology and kind of giving, again, you know, putting people in the seat that they're not quite ready to fill yeah. and, and letting them thrive. Well, it's, it's really interesting, um, you know, how practices of, I mean, how old is the business? It's about 100 years old, we were saying. The, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's over 100 years. I think we're at 105 now. Right. And it's always interesting how practices, uh, architectural practices go through that succession process. How had, was it, was this the first generation shift or I'd imagine there's been a, there'd been a kind of couple before. Uh, with, yeah. With so there's, that been, age. there's definitely been a few before myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Ralph Mancini started the firm 50 years ago. Ralph passed away uh, probably about four or five years ago at this point, right. unfortunately. Um, but Ralph was not, a, was not a licensed architect. Um, you know, I, he, he worked for a, a series of clients and he was really more of a drafts person as, as he kind of grew up in the industry. And he, he, but he was really good at winning work and he really knew construction. 
And some of his clients, one of his clients said to him, hey, you know, you need to up your game a bit. You know, this Mancini Associates thing, you know, you can do so much more. You're really doing an amazing job. You should buy this firm, O'Neill Duffy and Associates. And I remember Ralph telling me the story, you know, wow. I had no money. How am I supposed to buy another guy? You know, and I didn't know this Duffy guy from anybody. Somehow, who knows how they brokered a deal, but they brokered a deal. And Duffy can trace his roots through an acquisition that he made uh, a grandfathered architectural corporation. I don't want to get too technical called Halsey McCormick and Helmer. So that's technically the name of Mancini Duffy. It's Halsey McCormick and Helmer doing business as Mancini Duffy. Right. Kind of boring. Got it. Got it. Got <laughs> um, it. But that's what gave Ralph the ability uh, to, that's what kind of traces the, the roots back 100 years. Uh, but Ralph himself, the firm of Mancini Associates is about 50 years old. But altogether, that's what it is. At some point, Ralph, uh, in around 2007, Ralph wanted to retire. Yep. Ralph's wife, unfortunately, uh, uh, became ill with MS. And Ralph wanted to devote his time to his wife. And so he... Uh, devised a plan to, uh, a little bit before that, um, to sell the firm to Tony and Dina and a few other partners. And they went through their ownership transition. Um, and then when it became my turn, um, <clears throat> it's interesting how this goes. And for anyone listening that works at a, at a corporate architecture firm, or frankly, any, probably any company, um, it's amazing when you ask the question to the ownership uh, how candid they will be. So I asked Tony and Dina very um, candidly and not necessarily out of nowhere, but in a, in a conversation, I said, hey, what is your plan to retire? You know, what, what are you looking to do when you retire? How, how can I own this firm? Um, because at that point I had been running the firm. We had done the things with the culture uh, we were winning new jobs and growing. And Tony said to me, well, nobody's ever made me an offer. Um, so that night I went home and I drafted up an offer. I basically wrote a letter that, and I spoke to two other younger partners here at the office that I had become close with, um, Bill Mandera and Scott Harrell. And I said to them, hey, listen, guys, I've come up with a plan to purchase the firm from Tony and Dina, and this is how we're going to do it. Um, we're going to um, come up with a valuation of the firm. And so we, we went through that value um, and figured out a per share cost. Um, the firm, um, you know, kind of taking in the firm's, you know, debts and credits and the value of everything, we came to this share uh, price. And I said to Tony, this is how we're going to buy you. Over the next five years, we are going to pay you X amount of dollars per month. Uh, we didn't want to burden the company with debt. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, we, and I also wanted to have skin in the game, not only for myself, but for other partners and future partners. Yeah. This idea that we were truly buying the firm. It wasn't being gifted to us. It wasn't shares in a bonus structure. It wasn't because yeah. I sort of, I've researched all of those things. Yeah. And so we came back to Tony and Dina and laid it out and said, this is how we want to buy the firm. And Tony agreed. Fantastic. <laughs> Shockingly. So, so um, do you mind sharing some of the some of the details in, in inside of that? How that how that actually works? Because that's really really fascinating. Because you know, again, talk a lot at the moment with um, corporate practices um, and going into employee ownership schemes and other types of parts of ownership. And here, what you're saying is that you you went through your valuation process, um, and I assume you'd have had your team of uh, teams of accountants, kind of or independent valuers. Working on yes, that we, well. hired, we hired a firm that values architecture firms. Right. Okay. Um, and then the AIA has a way of doing it. Um, and then Tony, I always remember Tony had his own way of doing it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. And so we, we've actually had three very different valuations when it all came down to it. Um, and then we met in the middle. I mean, frankly, we, we truly met in the middle. I think the share price that we had come up with you know, someone had one of the valuations was, you know, $80 a share. Someone was $30 a share and we met in the middle. 
Got it. And, and that's, that's how we ultimately purchased the firm. Got it. Wow. And then being able to buy the, uh, by Tony, well, by the, by the firm, Tony, I'm assuming, was it a mixture of your own personal income or profits from the, from the business that was then going into that and then transferred to yourself or? Yeah, no. So it was no profits from the business. This, uh, this was a purely uh, personal investment that we right. all made. Yep. And it, it goes back to my freelance. So I had done enough freelance for many, many years to stockpile uh, a savings. I love it. Um, and then, you know, living in New York City, uh, my wife and I had sold uh, one of our, uh, an apartment and we upgraded to another apartment and then we were getting ready. We moved to New Jersey. And so, um, uh, you know, we had money left over from the sale of the apartment. And so that all in combination uh, was enough to give Tony a down payment for all intents and purposes, and then do a monthly payout over, a, you know, a five year period. Great. And then ultimately what we did too, is we, we told Tony that, you know, we'd like to take some of the shares um, that existed between him and Dina and actually put them back into the company uh, for future ownership. And ultimately we ended up selling uh, portions of the firm to, to more partners uh, here. So it's really five of us now that own the firm mm-hmm. um, and, and that's our, our CFO, uh, Bola. Uh, Williams Ali, and then also Jessica Manamato, who is our design principal. So the five of us own this firm. Um, and our, our goal was, you know, as we bought it was, you know, this idea that, you know, we're still young. Uh, we own this hundred year old firm. We have this amazing name. Um, so, you know, it's kind of the best of both worlds. You know, can you go out on your own? Sure. Um, but we, we're sort of starting on second or third base and kind of having our own firm, Yeah. Um, you know, which, which makes the, the types of projects that we're interested in um, just a lot easier to get, which in our case is usually the larger, the larger yep. projects. A, a brilliant, a absolutely fascinating uh, way of how, how ownership has been transitioned. Um, yeah, and, and one, one more thing I will say, Tony and Dina were great about stepping out of the way when we mm. uh, bought the firm. Dina retired pretty much right away. Tony um, stayed on for another year uh, he was originally going to stay on for three, uh, and then I think he realized, you know what, eh, I might, I might be in the way in three. Yeah. Uh, and again, to their credit, they let us run the firm the way we saw, you know, kind of bringing it into the era that we're in now. And um, you know, I really, I, I can't thank them enough in the way they did it. And as I said, if you, anyone listening, you know, approach your ownership. You may be surprised mm-hmm. by the by the answer. I mean, hey, I'm right now. I. I want to know who in 20 years is going to buy me. So <laughs> amazing, amazing. And so what were some of the first things that you, you as the, the new leadership team and the new owners that went about shifting or course directing, course changing? Yeah. So, um, you know, really it became about the culture here. Um, the culture needed to be changed uh, in terms of it was a very corporate, you know, architecture firm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'd say for us, it was two things that we really, you know, tried to define, you know, what was our purpose? You know, why are we here? What, what are the types of projects we do? Um, you know, what makes us different from other large architecture firms in New York City? Um, and for us, that became really the entrepreneurial side or intrapreneurial, as we call it, um, where using technology in our design process um, and inviting our clients into that process has changed the way that we work with our clients and ultimately deliver our, our projects. And so that really became, you know, the why. Why do we exist? What, what's going on here at Mancini Duffy? And, you know, what can someone here latch on to? And then as silly as it might sound, the second thing is to have fun. Mm. So going back to those lessons that I had learned from, you know, Gary and from, you know, my times at the previous firms, uh, you know, we, we did have a lot of fun in those. And it really was about a work-life balance. Um, for me personally, it was about family. You know, at that point, you know, I, have, I still have young kids um, and I like being home to eat dinner with them. And we encourage that kind of stuff here. Not that it, not that, you know, people don't end up working long hours and, and doing what they have to do, but 
it's not mandated. You're not looked upon as you're, uh, you know, clocking in and clocking out. It's a very different way. And New York City can be a, uh, a very cutthroat kind of uh, world in the architecture um, industry here. Yeah. You know, late nights and, you know, if you're not working all nighters, then you're not working kind of thing. And that's just not who we were. And, yeah. you know, encouraging working mothers and, um, you know, kids mm-hmm. and, allowing them to come in the office if you have to. And the, the pandemic and um, you know, working from home has certainly made that even easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's been something that we set out to do um, from the beginning and you know, just, just kind of be normal and cool and fun. And, um, you know, and then in terms of building the culture, um, we started out with really hiring people's friends. So I said to everyone, like, if you've got a friend, hire them. Like, let's, let's bring them in, let's meet them. And we developed a very close bond with, because people knew each other, um, they were socially um, um, friendly and then they became work friendly too. So right. that began to build the staff um, and a trust within the staff, um, which was you know, pretty important as, as we, as we you know, continued to grow. Did, did the, has the scale of the office changed much or is it still roughly the same sort of amount of team or has it actually physically grown in terms of staff? So when I started here uh, in 2012, the firm was about 35 people. Mm-hmm. Um, we are now about 75 people. Okay. Uh, at one point we were, we were larger. We were at, at 90. Um, you know, we, we, we downsized almost... Uh, a couple of reasons why we downsized. One is I felt it was getting a little too big. It was hard to kind of, the culture was hard to maintain. Um, and I, I never had the desire and, and really still don't have the desire to be an enormous firm. I think a, you know, a 75 person firm is a, is a really good size because, right. um, you know, I think about my, my kid's school has a, uh, a motto that every child is known and valued. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how we feel here. We want to know and value everyone that works here. And, you know, what do they want to do with their career? How can they move up in their career? What are the things that, what do they want to do not in their career? You know, what are their family plans? Where do they want to live? How do they want to mature? And so all of those things become important uh, in terms of keeping people motivated to stay here. Uh, and then also just, you know, in, in life, it's important to, to know what people want to do and from that, we've created other business units, just knowing what people wanted to do here. Amazing. You used the, the phrase earlier, entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial. What is, what is your uh, interpretation at Mancini Duffy of, the, of entrepreneurial? What does that mean? So what that means for us here is um, we wanted to give those that work here the ability to kind of find their own path, mm-hmm. that we didn't want to define it for them. And so what that really means is that if you had a desire to do something in your career, um, let's say an, a, an example is I had, we had someone approach us that works here, an interior designer, and, and she said, you know, I, I have this desire to really do more interior decorating and styling. Um, while I love interior design, I really want to talk about the final layer of design. You know, what are the what are the plants that go into the, to the space? What's the artwork program that they have? How do we accessorize? Uh, and she presented a business plan uh, kind of out of nowhere and said, this is my business plan for something called Mancini Duffy Lux, which we later renamed MDLX. And it was, and it is still to this day, it's the, we offer that as a separate service. It's a separate company that she owns 50% of, and then Mancini owns the other 50%. And, you know, she has her own business plan, her own bank account. Um, You know, at at times when she's busy, she hires uh, freelance people to uh, take on projects and she goes out and seeks her own work. And, you know, it's amazing. She decorated uh, uh, several hotels around New York City, Uh, you know, literally sourced and and procured all of the, the you know, the pads and pencils and accessories inside the rooms and did all the install herself. Um, and then our, our project managers know to kind of ask that question, you know, in a project or, hey, what are you doing for your artwork here? What are you doing for to accessorize your co-working space? 
And, you know, she then steps in and takes that over as a, as her own, as her own project. And so that, that's what I mean. I mean, she really was entrepreneurial. She saw a need with our clients and she created her own business right here. And, you know, we were, I mean, I was delighted. And, and that's another, you know, piece of advice for, you know, anyone listening is if you have an idea, you would be shocked if you approached your leadership with a, with a business plan. And I'm not talking, you don't need a 30 page business plan, you know, one page plan that just says, this is what I'm going to do this is why I'm going to do it. And this is how I think I can actually make money. Uh, and you'll be shocked as to, you know, how people will react to that and be mm. excited. Um, we had another person who, I don't even know why, but he wanted to do work in aviation and do airports. We had no experience with that whatsoever. I mean, when I tell you Mancini Duffy has zero aviation experience and he little by little chipped away and chipped away and he got an airport lounge for American Airlines at JFK. And then that evolved into another lounge um, and Boston Logan. And that evolved to another lounge and another mm-hmm. lounge. And then we were doing work at LaGuardia and the new buildings being built there. Um, and now, you know, he's going after entire airports, you know, smaller airports. I told them, you know, yeah, let's, let's, we're, we're ready. Let's do it. Let's go for the, let's go for the small sort of, you know, uh, commuter airports, and then let's get that under our belt. And then before you know it, we'll be able to go for the big guys and compete with, you know, an HOK. Yeah. And this is one guy's idea. Uh, and, and he's, and he's grown that from literally nothing. Uh, and then the, the big one for us is the technology. Um, so we, you know, one of the, one of the ideas that I had early on was that the architecture world needed to grow. Uh, and really start to um, use technology appropriately. So as I said, I started out hand drawing, I learned 3D modeling, but it's really until Revit, you know, you're just mimicking hand drawing for all intents and purposes. Yeah, yeah. And we never use Revit for the power that it is. And I, and I you know, for, it kind of bothered me for some reason. So we developed our own, um, our own uh, room here called the R&D lab, which we call the design lab. Mm -hmm. And that lab is dedicated to about eight or so experimental technologies in the world of architecture. So drone, we've made our own drone. We have a 3D printing factory. I mean, we literally print the ideas to print parts of our built projects, um, whether that's the signage or actual brick systems that we've developed. Yep. Um, But the main thing for us has been virtual reality. Uh, and really integrating virtual reality into our process. And extraordinary. What, what, what's so interesting as well here, you talk, talking about the uh, innovation in technology and innovation in business, um, which is really inspiring to hear. As the leadership of Mancini Duffy, how, what, are the, what are the things that you are doing or nurturing that allows people that kind of freedom to come and present new ideas with you? It's interesting. Um, I think it's because uh, we're very transparent. Um, You know, we, early on, as I said, I I have absolutely no business training whatsoever. Uh, My father uh, owned radio stations and was a business person. I can say we barely talked about business, you know, when I was growing up, he's been a great sounding board to ask questions yeah. about. Um, but other than that, I've, I've had no business training. It's really kind of learning, you know, as I go. But one thing that I did early on was hire a, a coach, uh, a business coach. And that coach helped us really define a few things about us. Um, again, kind of distill what is our business plan? and not a business plan. And that's kind of where I got the one page plan from. We literally have a one page business plan for all of Mancini Duffy. Um, And it's great because it's simple. You don't have to go searching for anything. It's all there laid out super clear. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was to be transparent about the fact that we had hired a coach uh, and that, you know, the, the meeting rhythms and, you know, how we were going to disseminate information um, wasn't really my idea. It was the coach's idea. 
Um, but, but one of my ideas was to be transparent. So one of the things that I'd say in terms of the negatives that I had learned from the previous experience that I had at the other firms was that even as, a, as much as I had worked my way up into the leadership of those firms, I still had no idea what was going on at the right. firm from the financial point of view, from a business point of view. I have no idea to this day, do those firms make a killing or a profit? Do they not make a profit? Are they lifestyle businesses for the owners? I have no mm-hmm. idea. Um, so, you know, I think in order to foster this idea of being entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial within the office, we had to be transparent. Um, and we are extremely transparent. I mean, I show the financials quarterly to the entire firm. We, you know, we put them up on a screen and we show them and that can be scary, uh, to some people. It could definitely be scary in the beginning. I mean, listen, this is an architecture firm. This is a professional services firm. We're only as good as our last project. And, you know, we can pretend, I don't care how big you are, uh, you can pretend, you know, that you've got some other master plan, but that the reality is, is we bill hours and the money comes in and the money goes out. Yeah. And somewhere in there, we need to be efficient. So showing that to everyone and saying, okay, look, this is what we did this month. It was a great month or vice versa. Hey, this is what we did this month. And look at that. It's not been great. Um, And this is how we're going to turn it around the next month or the following quarter or whatever that might be. And I think that level of transparency and approachability Mm. gave people the comfortable, you know, wherewithal to come and, and talk to myself or Bill or Scott or Bola and say, Hey, you know, I see that, you know, there's a need for this. Um, Or, you know, in the case of our design lab, uh, Michael Kipfer, who runs the design lab, you know, he's the one that really said, I have an idea for how we can change our process. We can make it so that, you know, what a normal architect can do in three weeks, I have an idea of how we can do it in three hours by, you know, manipulating the Revit model through a gaming engine, through custom software that we're going to write. And I said to him, you got to be crazy. What are you talking about? We don't write software. And he said, I know a friend who can write some software. And so that's how we ended up hiring developers. So we have two full-time software developers that work in our lab that are writing you know, our software for us called the Tool Belt um, that gives you the ability to interact with our 3D model in real time It creates a rendering at the same time. It creates a VR experience at the same time. And all the while you're manipulating the Revit model. And it truly has changed our process. Um, And so it's that kind of level of transparency that, you know, being vulnerable enough to say, hey, these are the things that we're doing well. And these are the things we're not doing well. And oh, by the way, you know, yeah, I own the firm. And yeah, I have all these great ideas, but I need your help, everybody, you know, out here in the firm. And I'm, I'm, perfectly willing to admit that. And I think that's gone over really well here. And that's why we've become such a close-knit family, but then also the ability to, um, to grow into areas we've never, I would never would have experienced. Amazing. It's so fascinating how much, you know, that kind of the courage that it takes to be that radically transparent, if you like, but the, the benefits that have come from it are extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. And it, listen, it, it can, it can scare people too. I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't. Um, and the pandemic has certainly thrown a little wrench into that. So Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, again, full disclosure, I just showed a, a quarterly presentation from last year that showed, you know, an amazing January, February, March of 2020. And then, you know, if you look at the chart, it kind of steps its way down to December. Yeah, Yeah. And, but the, the, My point of showing that was, hey, guys, take a look. We had a great start of the year. That great start propelled us to keep the firm going Hmm. through the pandemic. Look, we're coming out of the other side because we've actually gotten quite busy since then. We are Hmm. on our on a road to profitability already again. And and listen to say to them, we were willing as an ownership group to not make profit, to lose money but we want to make sure that we keep everybody here employed because it's important because we know, again, we have a greater purpose. We know what we're trying to do in our architecture world. And so it's very important to keep everybody here. And Hey, if we don't make money this year, so be it. We'll, we'll continue to move on. And as long as everyone has a job and we can provide health insurance for everybody and everybody's family is, is safe and happy. 
by the time we get down the road here and this pandemic is over, we'll be that much stronger and better as a group. And I think everyone here has appreciated that, that that's our feel. Again, I'm in it for the long haul. You know, I got 20, 30 years left of this thing. So mm -hmm. uh, a pandemic, you know, it's going to be a blip, a blip on the screen, um, you know, when we look back. An interesting one, but, a, but a <laughs> extraordinary. Uh, you, you mentioned um, the one page business plan. What, what sorts of things or what's on the one page business plan? Sure. So <laughs> the one page plan has um, a couple things. It reminds us of, you know, what our, uh, what our core values are, um, which, you know, are, are kind of, they're personal to us, um, but our core values are, are kick ass every day, never settle, uh, keep it quirky, uh, and make it happen. So those are our, our four core values. Um, and then it talks about, you know, what our revenue plans are for the current year that we're in, mm -hmm. what they would be in a three-year projected time, and then um, a 30-year projected time. So we do a one, three, and a 30-year plan. Got it. And the 30-year plan, the idea behind it is it gives us the ability to really try to look long range down the road because the reality is to make a, even a three year plan, we have no idea what's gonna happen. I mean, you could have a pandemic as it turns out um, and throw a wrench in it. Um, but this idea that you could have a 30 year plan and what do you wanna be in 30 years and how do you wanna get there? That can really help set you up for keeping your eye on the ball and keeping a forward look to everything you do and not be skewed by the numbers and the, you know, the net revenue versus, you know, the gross revenue and all these things. And so that plan has that, it has the gross revenue, the net revenue, it has what our, our profits want to be. We have, you know, very technical things like how many days are, you know, do we want to get our receivables down from, you know, 90 days to 60 days, that kind of thing. And that obviously helps with the cash flow. How much cash flow, how much cash do we want to have in the bank at the end of the year um, for tax planning? And then how much cash can we reserve for things like bonuses and raises the following year? So if we plan all of that out, uh, it gives a roadmap to, to everyone in the firm. And we show that. Here's our plan. Um, and this is how we're going to get there. And now everyone has an idea of, oh, okay, if I do this, this is what my reward is going to be at the end. So let's, let's all do this together and figure it out. Uh, and then we put on there quarterly goals. Um, so as a leadership group, you know, we come up with what's the one thing that we want to do in this quarter to accomplish. And the idea is, you know, a lot of times what we would do in the past is we would, we would come up with a list of 50 things that we wanted to do. You know, we're going to redo our marketing materials. We're going to clean the library. We're going to, I don't know, paint a giant blackboard in the lobby and, you know, show all of the, we, one time we were going to do bobblehead dolls of everybody in the firm. I mean, it's silly stuff, right? We had this whole laundry list of stuff. And in the end, nothing got accomplished because mm. you just got consumed by your day to day. And so we put a, we put the one thing that we're going to do on a quarterly basis that's outside of the normal day-to-day -day business work. Yeah. Uh, and that kid, you know, that we put a team on that quarterly goal and then we have a check-in for it. And that gives us the ability to accomplish just one more thing uh, as we kind of move forward. And by the end of the year, we've accomplished four things that are big picture um, that are not part of our daily business. And, uh, you know, four more things are checked off the list and we're, we're on to the next. Amazing. Love it. Yeah, and that's, it's really very simple like that. Brilliant. Um, just circling back a little bit to you, the discussing about the tool belt, yes, um, and kind of this the the lab within the office. Is this now its own its own company in itself, or how does that? Operate? Yeah, so the tool belt is now officially its own company. It actually has a a, a website. I think it's called thetoolbelt.com. <laughs> I should know that, right? Um, <clears throat> so, again, the idea, and it's actually a piece of software that we are looking to sell. Uh, to other architects. Um, you know, it's become part of our process, as I said, but what it is, is it's software in the VR environment that when you look down uh, in with the VR goggles on, you see essentially a tool belt uh, in front of you, like a traditional workman tool belt. And there's a series of tools that can help you manipulate the model. 
the beauty of this piece of software is that you're manipulating the Revit model in a virtual reality environment. Um, so you can change the materials, you can move things around, you can build objects, um, you can uh, <clears throat> obviously navigate. It's extremely interactive, but there's no data loss. So as you, as you move through the Revit model and you make these changes, it's recording it in the Revit model. Now, typically we save as a separate version so, so as to not mess things up. Um, but the, this process, um, we've adapted it for COVID so that you no longer actually need to be in VR. We have a multiplayer version of it. Um, and it's all patent pending now. So I'm, I'm allowed to talk about it, which is great. So thank you for, for asking the question. Um, and so we can have a virtual meeting in the Revit model from anywhere in the world. So everyone would log in, you get a link, you log into your Revit model uh, and everyone sees one another, an avatar version of themselves and we can have a meeting. So if we're designing a, let's say a school and we wanna move from classroom to classroom, we, everyone logs in, they're now in the lobby of the school and now we can all move together or we can move separately. Someone you know, that wants to go see the science classrooms can go navigate to the science classrooms themselves. They can make the changes, they can leave notes. Mm -hmm. um, it's all being documented as we go. It really is a virtual meeting. We can call everyone back together. Uh, you can log in if you want at two in the morning and make your changes. We have a restaurateur that loves to be inside his model, loves it. And, you know, he would come to our lab for hours to the point where we'd have to say to him, hey, um, you know, we have some other meetings in here. Do you mind uh, kind of moving on? Just because he wanted to see his model and see what he was building and, you know, play with the inches behind the chairs and, you know, he was very much about, you know, what's the feeling of the space going to be? And he could get a sense from our software. And so now we've given him the ability to do it at any time at night. So he's always in his model, tweaking and leaving us messages and notes. And then the next morning we get a report as to what he did. Uh, and, you know, then we can obviously discuss what that means. And we're in the process of connecting it now to the construction side. You know, what are the costs? So when you move something you know, did you add costs? Did you, did you, yeah. you know, reduce costs? That kind of thing. So we're, we're in development now on uh, all sorts of new versions of it as well. Fantastic. Brilliant. And um, just to start, uh, some of your uh, marketing or outside endeavors, I, I noticed that you've, you've launched your own podcast, the Anti-Architect <laughs> Podcast. What was some of the inspiration behind that? Yeah, so... Um, you know, I've, I've tried to be more active on social media and frankly, I'm, I'm just not good at it. Um, uh, our firm is very good at it. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're very good about showing ourselves off and, and what we do, but me personally, it's just something that I'm, I, I'm not comfortable with in terms of Instagram and Facebook and things like that. But LinkedIn, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share. And I, I enjoy posting articles and hearing people's feedback and showing off our work. There's something about LinkedIn I, I, I enjoy. And someone said to me, well, you know, if you're, uh, if, you're, if you're enjoying LinkedIn, you know, you should have a podcast because, you know, a podcast is like having a website. Now you have to have it. I thought, oh, yeah. okay. Well, eh, you know, what kind of architecture podcasts are out there? I discovered yours, um, which, as I said, I've, I've enjoyed yours. Um, even my kids will, will I, I told you this earlier, my kids will, will let me listen to it in the car for about 10 minutes before they say, hey, can we put on our music? So there, there's something special. About we're getting there. there. We're getting there. <laughs> um, and so really my, but I wanted to come at it with an edge, right? The same idea, the way we built Mancini Duffy, you know, and what, what kind of lessons have we learned here that we can also, you know, embark um, in the world of, of architecture. And so the concept is really a critical look uh, at how architects work with their clients and then in turn, you know, how our clients see us. Um, so the, the concept is to have people that, that work with architects on, and I want it to be critical. I, I, not, not necessarily bad, um, not mean, um, but I want it to be a real look at what we do right as architects and what we do wrong. Mm. And, you know, everyone can learn from that, again, about being transparent. So we've had some of our own clients on. We have a, a, um, several lined up of some other, other people, like, you know, high-level people that have worked with architects. So the idea is to have um, people that have worked with architects come on 
and uh, really tell us their stories. You know, hey, did we get the schedule right? Did we kind of um, fake fake the schedule? Did we present you truly with the costs up front? Hey, were you honest about the costs? Mm. Were you honest about the money that you had to spend on this kind of thing? You know, did um, did the architect uh, you know really understand what you were looking for? Did they listen? Uh, did they have an ego? Um, did are you as a client, were you a good client? I mean, I've had clients say to me, and we have some of the most wonderful clients, but I have had clients say to me, I know I'm a bad client. Client confession. So that, that's the kind of person I'm really interested in talking to. And so if you know you're a bad client, why are you a bad client? But maybe we can learn from that, right? As architects, maybe we can learn kind of what makes the client tick and what do we do and how do we meet, you know, in the, in the middle. Brilliant. Love it. I think that's a, a good place to, to conclude the conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Yeah. Absolutely amazing to hear all the innovation that's happening at Mancini Duffery and, and your, uh, your leadership and how you've managed to evolve the culture. Um, I, actually, one, one last question before we, we wrap up. Does the stone pony mean anything to you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. A, I'm a very big Bruce Springsteen fan. Um, I grew up near the Stone Pony about 20 minutes. Uh, never in my wildest dreams would have thought I'd end up raising my family about 20 minutes from the Stone Pony yet again. Uh, and I do live down there, even though our firm's in New York City and, and, and New Jersey. Uh, we live, you know, we live uh, about 20 minutes from the Stone Pony. And, Amazing. Uh, yeah. So do you know it? I do. I Well, my parents are big Springsteen fans. And uh, nice. so every time they've been to New York, um, there's always been some sort of excursion to the Stone Pony to have a look. Awesome. Um, and um, I went there a few years ago. What, what's, there's, there's a beautiful um, town just nearby. It's Ashbury. Asbury Park, yeah. Asbury it's in Park. Asbury Park, yeah. Yeah, with, with all the beautiful wooden houses and... Yeah. And um, yeah, so... Yeah, that. Asbury has seen a real revitalization uh, in the past few years. And now with the pandemic, kind of a lot of people leaving New York City, uh, really just rediscovering the Jersey Shore, you know, Bruce Springsteen territory. Um, yeah. Asbury is blowing up right now. So fantastic. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Now we've got the, the spring, the love of Springsteen uh, to, to share as well. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, really wonderful conversation. And uh, I hopefully when, next time I'm in uh, on the East Coast, um, I'd love to come and visit and say hello. Absolutely. would love to have you. Maybe we can coordinate it with a, a Bruce show. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Now we're talking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you again much. for having me. Cheers. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.